So I am quite excited about this, this webinar. We had to reschedule it once, but here we are back again, and I'm really excited. So we're, what we're going to do today, so today um, we've got these three amazing women who we're gonna have back on screen shortly. Uh, but what we're gonna do is show you the first uh, 20 minutes of the documentary, um, The Psychedelic Renaissance. And then we're gonna invite you all back for a panel discussion, some questions and answers, and um, and then we'll so we'll see you back. We'll see you back in twenty minutes. Here we go. My name is Leonie Schneider. I've had low-grade depression for over 20 years with a couple of pronounced episodes and have been on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for that entire time. Prior to every major depressive episode, I start feeling that they're not working, which then begs the question, what's changed and why have they stopped working? I could feel things getting wibbly and I could feel that I was living a life half-lived because for me the antidepressants have quite a numbing effect so I wasn't feeling the pain but nor was I feeling the joy. I thought well something's got to change because this is slowly killing me. I came across uh, the research that Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt were doing at Imperial College and saw that there was a psilocybin for depression trial that was running. This was the second of, of the trials that they'd done in this regard. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. Um, and it certainly gave me something different. I'm Michelle Baker-Jones. I'm an integrative relational psychotherapist. I've been working private practice for 10 years. And in 2015, I joined Imperial College's psychedelic research team, where I've been a psychedelic guide on Psilodep 1 and Psilodep 2. And I'm currently now a psychedelic guide on the most current DMT trial. As a traditional talk therapist, it takes a really long time to help people shift out of their depression, their anxiety. In the psychedelic experience, sometimes we can access parts of ourselves that have been split off or they've been repressed. And through the process of a psychedelic experience, they come to the surface. And if we can integrate those into our psyche, then we become more whole, more integrated. During the experience, there was a particularly powerful piece of music which started off with a rather discordant piece of music. It was maybe a cello, it was a string instrument, which sounded really broken to me. And it, it, at, at that moment, a visual of my mum, who had, had a protracted illness, came to mind. And she almost took on the form of a waddling duck with a broken limb. And it felt like she was dragging herself along. And I, I wept bitter tears. I felt that my life was similar. I felt her life was pointless and limping, broken through it. And what happened during the course of that piece of music is that as the, the music evolved um, and other instruments were added to it, that broken note became part of the most beautiful symphony. And during that must have been what eight piece eight minutes of music I realized that my mom's existence her her purpose made sense in the wider symphony of life I realized my part in all of this I realized I wasn't her I realized I wasn't my depression and that so much of the pain I was feeling was pain that had come down from from my mum from my mum's mum it was this point that I whipped off the mask and I, I looked at Michelle, my, my psychedelic guide, and I pronounced with great confidence that I was surprisingly unbroken and that so much of what my depression had been for me was stuff that was brought down and put on me. Indeed, psilocybin is an effective treatment for depression. However, it works in complicated ways that can be very difficult to manage. They're not cures or treatments in themselves. They can't just be given. They are catalysts, they are amplifiers, and they must be treated with care, or they will either be ineffective, or they could be dangerous. It can 
be a catalyst for an incredible therapeutic journey which needs to be ongoing, needs to have good aftercare because it can open people up and expose them to new risks in a way and make them more sensitive and destabilise them as well sometimes. These are tools, they must be treated very carefully rather than, you know, this is a magic, uh, a magic pill that's going to save the world. It's, it's something that can open a door, but it can open, it can open all sorts of doors and the doors can lead to lots of different places. My first experiences with psychedelics helped me a lot, but there was a trap there. Psychedelics that I've done, they were not done in a therapeutic mode. So I was guiding myself, and at certain times I misguided myself, and I crashed again. And the lesson there was, go to therapy. <laughs> and that helped me to work through all the trauma and actually realize I have complex PTSD, which I was hiding from myself all this time, thanks to psychedelics. And only then the real work started. And it was really hard, but it was necessary and I've done it. When I think about all the people in our study that have had two high doses of psilocybin, most of them would say that it gave them a, a break from depression that nothing else ever had before. But the study has really reinforced for me that psilocybin alone is not the work. The real work is the therapy. As the months have gone on, those participants, some of them have really maintained the work as much as they can and they've, they've tried to stay open and they've tried to continue some of the lessons that they learned from the work, which I think is the importance of going into your pain, going into your emotional difficulty and sitting with it and letting it be there and learning from it rather than pushing it away. And even though people are trying to do that and continue with that work, it, it's tough because without further psilocybin sessions and without really good follow-up therapy, it's very difficult for them to stay, to stay open. So people's depression has come back. So rather than seeing psilocybin as a kind of once or twice amazing tool to kind of break through things, unlock depression. I would say the message now is that it can be such an incredibly powerful beginning to a journey, but it's an ongoing journey that needs constant work. And it's a way of managing depression rather than curing depression. My name is Ashley and I'm an assistant psychologist working on the psilocybin for depression trial at Imperial College in London. And my role throughout has been helping people from the moment that they first get in touch to get involved with the trial. And then also guiding on some of the, throughout some of the study, and then looking after people in the aftercare and the follow-up. And that's been the biggest part of my role to make sure that people are supported once they finish taking part in the study and then go back to their lives and their communities. It started out that what I was going to be doing was supporting people to learn mindfulness and meditation because people tend to want to and because we know that during the experience the default mode network is deactivated in the same way that it is during meditation practice and that there's kind of increased cognitive flexibility. So mindfulness meditation seems to match really well in the aftercare phase it's because those same kinds of processes are being cultivated and we know that they're associated with psychological well-being. But what I realised um, as I was working with people with severe depression, people have quite complex needs and learning mindfulness is one really important thing that I think I've done with people. But the aftercare has really expanded to think about what other therapy people might need after an experience. Some people didn't have employment and wanted to try and move back into employment, so supporting them to make connections to local services where they could begin to build that aspect of their life. So thinking about people holistically, you know, in terms of all of the different aspects of their life, their relationships, their work, their mental health, all of these different things. For me, integration is really therapy. I suppose the idea is that once you've had your psychedelic sessions, you find natural ways to, to um, look after yourself for self-care. These experiences are, you know, can be hugely transformative and profound, but without um, the therapy or a way of integrating them into your everyday life, then that numinous or profound experience just kind of dissipates. And, uh, but, you know, in order to get the key learnings, you really need to kind of ground them in the everyday. There's a great deal of work to be done afterwards, after somebody's had a psychedelic experience, to make sense of what they experienced during the psychedelic um, acute experience and how they want to bring changes into their life to sustain and to maintain a life that is more full of hope and more connected to the values that they care about. And that's quite a big process. So I almost now understand integration as the beginning of a journey 
that happens after a psychedelic in creating the life that is meaningful for us. So you have such a profound experience and then to be, to be left um, can be quite isolating. Thankfully that hasn't been my experience, but I, um, I think from other trials, people have felt that they've had a glimmer of hope and then they're left to their own devices and the darkness can seem even darker at that point because you now know what you have and can't access again. I think it's crucial to then have ongoing and longer term um, psychotherapeutic support to work with the material and to integrate the richness of the learnings that you had during the dosing session. I think a lot of the healing and the healing for me personally has been trying to not only come home to myself but to come home to my body. Psychedelics can, can without proper holding or containment become really difficult to integrate which in a way is why I think group integration is really helpful because then you can see that other people have experienced this kind of dis discombobulating disconnect from reality and that helps kind of bring you down to realise that this is one of the effects that psychedelics can have and that in some respects that kind of shift of perspective, that kind of sense of moving out can be really great but if you can't come back in and land in your body, which is I think when embodiment becomes really crucial, it's like how do you reconnect back to your body, then it, it can be incredibly distressing. I think it's really crucial that there are more uh, psychedelic integration circles for people of colour and those who experience racial trauma um, because the psychedelic societies that do exist around the world um, are fantastic in many ways but also tend to be quite white dominated as a result speak to certain lived experiences so I think it's really crucial that there are more people of colour integration spaces. I also think that we need to continue advocating for more um, clinicians, therapists of colour and those with lived experience of different forms of trauma to also be entering the psychedelic space. I also think that we need to continue advocating for more survivors of the mental health system, those who've actually been forcibly committed or sectioned. It's really, really crucial that their input is also incorporated more into the space because so far uh, madness has been a kind of elephant in the room and I think more harm will be done um, than not if we continue moving towards uh, legalization and therapeutic use of these substances without the input of those who have experienced trauma at the hands of the mental health system and the medicalized approach to, to healing, which psychedelics is now being integrated into. I think there is a lot of exciting stuff taking place. I really love what the SAGE Institute in Oakland are doing. They're really pioneering um, models that clinics can use to actually offer low-cost psychedelic therapy to communities of colour um, and offset that with charging higher rates for um, other communities and I think this is a really exciting model um, that I definitely want to champion and, and celebrate and hope that others will replicate in different ways. MAPS are also doing a lot of internal work to train more therapists of colour so that's another exciting stream of really a lot more attention being placed on increasing the, the capacity that there is to really hold space for people with racial trauma. This is adjacent to the psychedelic world, but in this moment of the, the pandemic, there's so much more awareness about embodiment and trauma generally. So I feel like there's a, a more kind of mainstream understanding that's developing around um, how trauma from different aspects of our identities becomes sort of lodged in the body and that we need to be engaging with body-based therapies, as well as things like talk therapy and maybe psychedelic healing in order to really get at this intergenerational debris that many of us have going on. The psychedelics help people recognise the, the importance of being more in, in our bodies, so being more embodied. And whether that's doing yoga or dance or meditation or tai chi, anything that helps you, um, helps you to feel more embodied. What helped me to integrate the psychedelic experience was my practice that I had, which was yoga and some meditation and mindfulness. But I think the thing that helped the most was practicing connection with nature and gardening. Because the garden also um, gets ill, you know, the plants die and they get infected and then you see that you can make a little change and uh, things will go back to life and so things you have to sacrifice and burn and let go of. 
I think nature has been crucial to healing. I think you really realize, and there's something about psilocybin being a, a, a natural compound. You are more drawn to the natural environments. I'm part of a community group where we are working with the Celtic tree calendar. So every month we're identifying the tree of the month and really getting to befriend a tree in my neighborhood and, and follow its growth through the seasons and realize that you don't always have to be in full bloom, full spring, full color and glory, that it's okay to have periods and times of contraction, of, of darkness and death and decay. And that spring always comes out afterwards. And as a message for depression and how to manage that process and realizing it's a natural part of the cycles, I think it's, yeah, being part of nature and noticing those cycles really helps in managing your own mood and, and cycles. So this is your garden? Yes. It's been a little safe haven and a sanctuary the entire time. I started collecting all my trees. This is an oak tree, this month's tree. It mm. was self-seeded. Your baby? My baby. Aww. And this little oak tree was rescued. It was going to be mulched. Uh, and some local um, some local people collect the trees that were going to be mulched. Aww, and just, I just planted them. Interestingly, in the first study, one of the main themes was that people in depression described themselves as being very disconnected. And then afterwards, they described connecting to themselves, other people and the world around them. Connection to nature was something that a few people talked about. And they just described seeing the greens of the trees, of the park across the road or something that they'd never noticed before. And suddenly after their psilocybin experience, the greens are alive and they can't stop staring and they feel part of it. A few people also described that before their psilocybin experience, they just saw nature as a thing. It's just a thing like watching TV, looking at nature, going for a walk. And after psilocybin, they realized that it's not a thing. They are it. They are nature. That's when the penny drops for people about nature, that it's not just about a pretty thing to look at. It's an understanding that they are part of an interconnected web of life. And that just as nature has night and day and death and regeneration, there's this sense of people becoming resonant with the rhythms and cycles of nature in a way that there is a sense of acceptance of what's difficult. The whole therapeutic model in the study was um, called Accept, Connect, Embody. And it's about accepting what's painful and difficult, sitting with the darkness, connecting to the world around, connecting to the light, the joy, and a sense of embodiment, a sense of being not just in their minds, but in their whole bodies. Nature kind of encompasses all of that and that it's such a great way for people to integrate a psychedelic experience. We've had lots of stories of people that say that they've got a particular tree now that they go and, and hug and sit with, with the tree or that they just spend much more time walking in the forest. It's a free tool for, you know, it's, it's always there. It's a good teacher. What we're noticing is the large number of people who are doing a lot of reflection at the moment and looking for deeper meaning and answers and ways to deal with bubbling anxiety, I think that's COVID related, and are really seeking alternatives, including legal psychedelic retreats to come deal with things that are troubling them and, and get to the grips and to the nub of things. I think psychedelics, by its very nature, uh, invites a different way of working, a different way of living. It's about collaboration. It's about working as a community. It's about the mycelial network going underground and connecting people and working towards a greater common good. After lockdown, we know that people are really suffering. The mental health crisis is, is in a lot more intense than it was. You know, um, lots of people have been alone. And one thing we do know about psychedelics is the increased neuroplasticity, the increased connection, um, whether it's to yourself, to other people, to a spiritual principle. I mean, these are all the findings from Ross Watts's qualitative analysis and Psylodep 1. So their potential to create community, to create connection, to create mental health and well-being, I think is brilliant. I think being part of a community who are willing and ready to be really honest about their difficulties and not put up the pretenses and not in a culture where everything is on Instagram and everyone's leading a per perfect life. Realizing that everybody actually, part of the human experience is, is, is that it's messy and it can be difficult. And there's a range of emotions to be felt and that all emotions are, are welcome. You don't have to suppress the anger, the sadness, the resentment. Just feel the feelings and get through it. I think it's been revolutionary to realize and to watch people grow through the process and have the courage to do it yourself.
Wonderful. Thank you all. Wow. Beautiful work, you guys. So everyone, thank you for uh, joining us for that, the bit of the uh, psychedelic renaissance documentary. So you got a taste of the whole piece. Um, so I'm Dr. Pam Crisco. I am one of the founding board members of the Canadian Psychedelic Association, and I'm honored to be joined here today by these three remarkable women. Um, I'm going to allow them all to introduce themselves first, and then we're going to jump in. So Anya, Haya, and Mercedes, would you please introduce yourselves to our, to our um, members? Sure, I can go first. Um, so I'm Anya Olegshuk, uh, difficult Ukrainian name, but I'm Polish. I live in London. I'm a filmmaker, host, presenter, educator, uh, co-director of the Psychedelic Society in the UK, and a producer and director of the documentary that uh, you just seen the sneak peek of. Pass it over to Haya. Hi, so I'm Haya Al Hijilan. That's also a complicated uh, Arabic name. So, um, yeah, um, I am a, uh, I have a master's in applied positive psychology and coaching psychology, and I provide um, integration, psychedelic integration services. Um, I'm currently a assistant trainer with Fluence, and I'll be teaching a course starting next month on the psychological approaches to psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I also do events planning and curating with the Psychedelic Society, and uh, I am currently involved with some research on DMT with um, UCL in London. Oh, and, and um, with this documentary, I'm co-producing, co-directing. I for forgot the most important part. It's 2 a.m. over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Mercedes Grant. I'm associate producer um, on this project. I am a writer and a trauma and justice informed yoga teacher, um, community organizer, activist, witch, psychonaut, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I live on a place called Cortez Island, which is the traditional territories of the Klahus, Tham, and, and Hamalco First Nations. Uh, and I have ancestry and roots in England, Ireland, and Scotland. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful having you all here, and especially Haya at 2 a.m. Thank you so much for being up. I would not be up at 2 a.m. Um, in the old days, I might have been not anymore. Um, like, this is beautiful. Like It is wonderfully put together. I just want to say that. I mean, that's obvious to everybody who's watched. Um, but you, you all just told me this just before we came on, you have never met in person. Tell me about this. You are, you've never come together, right? Is that true? Well, you've been working on this. Can you tell me, um, more about that process? Like, this is an amazing, amazing footage. Um, do you want to, <laughs> do you want to go? Yeah. I mean, I guess I can just talk a little bit about how the heck we came together being so far apart from each other. Um, Haya and I actually worked at another organization in 2017 um, and really formed a bond. And um, yeah, she like pulled me into the project and I've been involved in various different ways from then on. I think Anya and I, I was in the UK in 2018 and Anya and I were in the same room and didn't know it, but um, yeah, but we've managed to build, you know, a really good relationship with each other via Zoom, many, many Zoom meetings and many personal calls. And um, I feel very close to these two, regardless of not having met them in person. Definitely. I've met, so I've met Haya many times. Um, I started doing this, I was pretty alone because I was just me. So a lot of face footage we've taken, it was me filming, producing, directing, editing, everything. I was really overwhelmed. I was like crying almost. And crowdfunding as well to obviously make any money to help me survive and eat while I do it. It was not easy. And then Haya was so young back then. It's 2018, I think. Um, Beyond Psychedelics in Prague conference, we had a table, uh, Psychedelic Renaissance, um, 
and we're just promoting the movie. And she came to the table, the most excited person <laughs> in the world, saying, I wanted to make a movie about this too. I thought somebody needs to make a movie about it. So glad you're making it. I need to work with you. <laughs> and I was like, okay, she seems very excited. A bit worrying, but also good. <laughs> and, then, and then she sent me an email, which I didn't reply to because I was just really overwhelmed. And then she sent another one. And then she said, sent third one saying, I know I'm being annoying right now, but I really want to work with you. So can you please answer my email? And I just said, I can't not answer after this. And I never looked back because she became not only saving this film and me and my sanity, but also she became a very dear friend. So we, as Mercedes said, we have this bond now, like sisters, and it's pretty beautiful. And I would say the same with everyone who you've seen on screen, like Ross Watts and Michelle, they became such close friends because we connected over the same issues and same solutions to those issues. So very, very close now. <laughs> Oh, that that's amazing and really the power of that you can actually still really connect uh, at a distance when you're aligned so I was going to ask you how long this took and you mentioned 2018 so we're four years in to this oh we're, we're five years in five years in okay and the one thing that we want to uh, emphasize everyone like we, we want to promote this maybe to help get it finished or the finish line so we're going to put the GoFundMe in for this um this documentary in the chat a couple times. So if you if you want to support these the this film and these women, please go to the GoFundMe page that will be in the chat box soon, and please share it with other people that care about the arts um, and information and um, these getting documentaries and this kind of quality of information out. So please share that around, and we'll post it a few times. So how so making this documentary for five years. Or, or this process over five years, you guys have been involved with psychedelics prior to that as well, in some way or another. How, how have you changed as, as people going through this process in the five years? Haya, would you like to start us off? Um, well, yes, I started, I started when I was about 24 and I was really um, very excited. Um, my my uh, prefrontal cortex and frontal lobes weren't fully developed yet. <laughs> so I uh, started off a bit um, overzealous, I would say. Um, and uh, the way that I looked at psychedelics was a bit problematic. And I'm very glad that I've, I've been able to change over time, although I, I'm still very optimistic and very hopeful about the future of the field. I'm a lot more um, aware of the nuances that I, I, I wasn't really aware of when I was, uh, when I was younger. Um, so yeah, so really getting to meet, also getting to meet people from all over the world working on this project has helped me form a, um, a better, more rounded um, uh, mentality when it comes to working with psychedelics so I'm a lot more aware of also some cultural issues that might arise so yeah I've definitely it's it's like when I think back to when I first came on to this project I was, I was a completely different person thank, thank god for growth Mercedes you want to hop in and then to Anya yeah sure this is a great great question because I'm like thinking I was actually thinking about this um before we started because just thinking about our progress with the film and how we all kind of started in this world and I, I was thinking to the first time that I got involved in like a psychedelic conference many years ago in Vancouver and hearing um, uh, people speak and and tell their stories about high dose mushrooms and and I just like it just blew my whole mind wide open and I was quite young to it as well too and um and also very naive and like very optimistic and like really wanted to get involved in that community and 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 did so and then also realized that there's a lot of nuance and a lot of growth and and um like any like to see for me it's still like very shocking to see the the changes that have happened so quickly in this field um having kind of seen it as someone who worked in like communications and PR where I had to like beg the media to cover stories like nobody wanted to touch this with a 10 foot pole and now it's like we kind of need to rein it in almost um so I think for me it's been a lot of personal growth because I've learned 
um, building relationship with these substances in particular has helped me. I have um, complex, complex post-traumatic stress disorder as well and um, have used ketamine and psilocybin to assist my healing and my growth. And, and I'm just incredibly grateful um, for learning and for the people that I've met and the relationships that I've built, especially with these two. Like I feel very grounded with this um, project and this group and that we can keep coming back to each other. So yeah, thank you. Right, so I suppose there were two changes, one as a person and one professional change, and they kind of went together. So when, when initially, like in a film, I already explained, when I initially started taking psychedelics for depression that I knew I have back then, they really gave me a massive boost immediately. I, I was kind of manic, I would say, for a bit and really happy. And this was working with my psychedelic evangelism stage of my kind of work but it wasn't too bad but I was really about all removing stigma because there was so much of it and people hated it so much that I was just telling how much they helped me and how much I'm feeling great but because of that as in the documentary I actually was bypassing proper complex PTSD which was addressed later so now I'm feeling great and also thanks to psychedelics as they assisted my growth out of that too but what happened with the mainstreaming and my own story and realizing that it's more complex and you need proper care and you need the community and you need either therapy or some kind of contextualizing in a circle some whatever you can do it's very 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 easy to fall into traps of mania and all those things so now the journey is really different and it's about making sure people do it in a safe way and responsible way. It's about spreading the news about harm reduction. And this is like face thing that we do. And if you watched our trailers and teasers from five years ago, they were quite different. They were not evangelizing, but they were like, yeah, how psychedelics helped all those people. But now we're really focusing on those more nuanced things like integration, preparation, and community around you, which we think is like the number one thing is the community for us right now. Well, and and in the process of this, like Mercedes, like you said, and Haya, like you talked about culture, um, this things have moved way faster than we would have ever thought five years ago I it, there's no way any of us would have guessed that we would be reading about psychedelics in Chatelaine right uh like that's pretty mainstream I guess um how is the how's it been watching this renaissance move like you, you've just talked about how it's how you've changed but how's it been to watch watch this move you want to start with Anya and then it's a bit scary how quick things are moving uh, because I feel like we don't have enough education out yet to make them so mainstream. Yet I have desperate people contacting every day thinking that this is going to cure their PTSD. Mm -hmm. Cure, that's the word I hear all the time and obviously they don't cure it. Today I had a conversation with TV producer who was so aggressive and pushing so hard for to make this crazy thing where, where he wanted to sit people in pairs on psilocybin without having any experience sitters and film it, but he would have six people in one day, which is three groups. And I was just shocked that he thought that those sitters would be able to sit people for like, I was 14 hours or something because he took mushrooms once and it was great. So he thinks now others take mushrooms and so the world will change for better. And I get that all the time and it's very scary. So yeah, so I don't wanna to be too negative, but it is, we need to really manage people's expectations and uh, correct people who are overzealous about the people who are in the same stage that we were years ago. Yeah, so at least we understand them because we were them. Mercedes or Haya? Mercedes, let me hand it to you and then to Haya right after. Um, yeah, 
I, it's been wild. It's been really wild. Like, I, I don't think I could have predicted any, any of this. I, I struggle with a lot of how quickly it's moved. I feel like humanity in general, when they find like a new technology that holds promise, there's a tendency to move too fast, um, which often like relates to whether or not it can be capitalized upon and, and, and money can be made from it. And that's kind of what I'm seeing, like the, the emphasis being put on. And then there's also like a reigning in that's happening right now, which I think is really good, um, where, you know, people are, are saying like, whoa, we need to, we need to take a second and really like understand these substances, which I don't, I think that's the, a major part of it is that, um, is embracing like the mystery of these things. Uh, of these substances and knowing that there's never, I don't think there's ever going to be a time when we fully understand what's, what's possible, but how we can build community and safety to be able to integrate these substances into people's lives. And for people who need, you know, the accessibility being a major issue as well is something that I see. Um, there's so many different tangents, you know, <laughs> so many different areas. Like when I hear Anya telling a story like that, I'm like, God, like, uh, yeah, I've gotten tons of information like that too, or people like requesting and, and wanting, wanting to be healed. They want to be cured from whatever it is. And they think it's a magic pill. And that's probably the number one line that I find myself saying over and over again is that this is not, it's not for everybody and um, it's not a magic pill and that just doesn't exist. And that's really hard to say that. And as someone who's, who struggles with mental health, I think, yeah, it's like, I wish that that was the case, but it's, it's not the case, you know? And I think also there's like a level of, of humility that comes with watching this movement progress that we're able to sit here and go back and say like, yeah, I was like really like gung ho and may maybe made some like poor decisions or um, could have done things differently, but we've managed to like grow and move. And if more people could like find that humility and like tell those stories of how they started and where they are now, um, that maybe we could yeah, things would be moving in a different direction. But with that being said, I think there's a lot of people doing really good work. I think there's a lot of work to be done still. Yes, it's been super interesting watching watching the development too. Um, I wrote my senior thesis in uh, for my undergrad in 2017 on the clinical uses of psychedelics. I actually got my title from a meme. Um, it was a, a meme of Albert Hoffman uh saying like ask your doctor if psychedelics are right for you and that was like it was hilarious back then but um still it's funny but um yeah so it, it back then when i was writing my my uh, thesis as an undergrad i only had a handful of papers to be to work with and a handful of um well no there was a, quite a bit of studies but i mean from more recent times there was uh, there was only a handful of, of of papers to be working with and since i mean it's there's been an absolute explosion with um research um which has been really exciting the worrying part is and i and i know that this has been expressed and this is a shared worry between anya and mercedes and i too which is the way that um ethics primarily and how capitalism can cause um can cause a lot of questions when it comes to ethics so the one thing that i am well one of the many things i'm worried of is people whose values i fundamentally stand against who are trying to who who haven't been involved with psychedelics for very long and suddenly now you know i have an mba and i'm a psychedelic specialist like it, i don't that really um is very irritating, but I understand that we do need to be working with, uh, um, uh, to a certain extent, we have to be ethically working with the corporate world also, uh, in terms of, of scalability and also, I don't know how this will work, but yeah, um, working with the cor corporate world for inclusion too. Um, yeah, and, but it's been, so it's been exciting. It's very worrying though, some parts are worrying. Um, What's been exciting for me is watching the conversation shift in the Middle East. I saw someone in the chat mention that they're from the Middle East too. So I'm going to be contacting you after afterwards so we can have this conversation. But yeah, it's it's really exciting that people are starting to talk about it over there. Um, where there's um, mental health is stigmatized all over the world, especially so in the Middle East. 
And the fact that people are speaking about psychedelics tells us a lot. It tells us that people are very ready for, uh, people have just had it. People are tired with the status quo. People are looking for something that um, can be effective. So I found, um, I've, I've heard psychedelics being mentioned at conferences in the Middle East. Um, and I've seen, uh, I've seen Michael Pollan's book being sold in uh, in bookstores in the Middle East. And I've had a ton of people um, call me for, or get in touch with me for integration sessions uh, in, in the Middle East too. But that's a bit, it's also a bit worrying because I do get people, you know, messaging me saying, oh, we're gonna go for a car ride and have some ayahuasca chocolate when I join. And I'm like, oh, that's not how we do it. Like, I mean, and then, you know, I, I speak to, I speak to people and I get to hear a little bit more of what they're going through. I'm like, okay, this is definitely, um, there's so many contraindications that you've just presented in the five minutes that we've been talking. So, so yeah, I think um, there are times definitely where I'm just like, oh my God, this is way too overwhelming. And I wish I could go back to the, to the happy go lucky 24 year old that I was when I first, or 19 year old when I first started uh, in this, in this world. But, um, but yeah, I do think that being able to, I mean, maturing myself and watching the field mature too. I've been better I, i'm better equipped now at being able to spot out risks and dangers so yeah excite so to summarize it's been exciting but scary <laughs> thanks the the culture part is really really interesting right because we're often very north american centric or, or european centric and um you know, where I am, I'm in British Columbia and psychedelics has been a, a no brainer for decades here. We've been doing research on psychedelics in British Columbia for decades. Um, and, uh, but I, I really like to hear your guys' comments on that from you're connected around the world. How does that look differently in different, in different cultures? I can start then. Um, I visited my country, Poland, uh, in November uh, last year and I'm um, coming from London where psychedelics are like, accepted uh, at least for mental health therapy people know about it BBC made the documentary so it's out there so I was like I'm gonna talk to people about psychedelics and psilocybin you know to my friends and I remember saying word mushrooms to my friend on the street and she got all red and started saying oh porcini mushrooms and I realized, and it started similar things were happening. And I realized that Poland is completely not. It's like UK 10 years ago. Uh, it's still a massive taboo. They, they work the psychedelic society there. They're all like therapists and neuroscientists. They're all really proper academics. None of them is artists and filmmakers, like half of the UK one. And their sole role is to remove stigma from psychedelics. That's all they do because the whole country is so backwards. And I believe Haya can obviously uh, chip into this conversation even more, having traveled so much between US, UK and everywhere. Yeah, um, and Saudi, well, I'm from Saudi Arabia and, and it's been interesting because there's actually, um, people have been actually quite positive, positively receptive to it recently, um, which, was, which was surprising to me. I, um, there was an article that was written by I'm forgetting what news outlet, but it's a huge, it's a huge Saudi news outlet, and um, the title was uh, "Can a psychedelic or can magic mushrooms um, prove to be effective treatment in mental uh, for mental illnesses?" And it was hilarious because in Arabic, the way that they they named it, I think only one person will understand it here, but "al fatra sahri," which means magic mushroom, but it just sounds really funny in Arabic. So here's here's the cult, I guess, a cultural. Um, uh, Anyways, going back to culture, what was I saying about um, the uh, about yeah? So about the the nuances with culture, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But there was also another. Um, I just got contacted recently from someone from Arab News, which is also a huge um, news outlet that asked me uh, to ask to talk to me about um, MDMA therapy. But she's also disappeared, so I don't know. I don't know what that really says about whether or not we actually have progressed. A few years back, I emailed the Saudi FDA to ask to suggest piloting the uh, psilocybin for I mean psilocybin for smoking cessation study that uh, that Johns Hopkins did so to do a replication in Saudi and I had never heard back from them so so culturally yeah I mean I think we're still a ways behind but um, 
it's I've made it really my life uh, my life mission to um, to make sure that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy becomes accessible in in the Middle East. Yeah, it's a it's a mountain that I'm going to be climbing, but but hopefully um, I'll be climbing with a lot of people, so it'll be a fun journey. Oh, and one more thing, if I can say about culture, I hope I'm not. Uh, um, again, I'm just going to say it's it's almost three here, so forgive me for not being completely lucid here. But yeah, um, in terms of culture, I think there's still so much to be bridged with psychology and culture, Arab culture or, or non-Western culture. So that's even the the challenge is even more with psychedelics. But then you could argue that maybe psychedelics will make that challenge a bit. Um, will make it a bit easier because psychedelics are catalysts. So maybe it will help catalyze this, this bridging between therapy and, and uh, other cultures. Did you want to add, add anything, Mercedes, before I... Yeah, just to, just to echo, that's really wonderful, Haya. And you're being completely lucid considering that it's three in the morning. So thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to mention that like when we first started with this project, when I first started working with Haya way back, like it was, we had to be very careful about the conversations we were having and Haya had to be very careful um, as well. And like, there has been like a, a shift, like to hear that there's like a, like news covering um, maybe if, even if it's one article, like that's a, it feels like a big deal, you know, and that th there is. It seems like to me different cultures are existing on different timelines with how they're progressing with these things um and that it will take it will take time depending on where you are um and also that we could learn to yeah have some restraint um and maybe slow down a little bit in our western push 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 kind of um culture culture <laughs> What I really love about the clip that we showed today was how mature it is. You know, our Roots to Thrive program here in British Columbia, everything you're saying there, I'm like, yes, you know, that, that the, there's obligations of the therapist. There is obligations of integration. And that really, you know, your session is, is, is just, you know, the integration is just the beginning of that process and um, the diversity of what comes in a group, especially in a group integration session and how much more diversity can be honored and, and worked into that. Um, so I just wanna say thank you for th that maturity in there and really emphasizing that. Like clearly, I mean, the clinicians that you're highlighting in the, in the documentary are, are very qualified and very good. And they've been in this for a very, very long time. And that's, um, do you want to comment on the, the, when, what we see often, like especially something you alluded to, kind of this, you know, these ayahuasca chocolates, you know, kind of people having this psychedelic passport that they're trying to stamp like 5-MeO and then I'm going to do psilocybin and then I'm going to do this. And then there's lots of people jumping in after being doing one session and calling themselves a shaman or an integration expert and stuff. And that's happening. You're portraying something very valuable, very high quality taking care of people and recognizing the obligation that it continues well after. What, what advice would you give then to those in, that are not following that level? Well, I, I'm kind of preloading that question, of course, apologies for my bias, but um, there is a lot of that. How, how, do you, um, how do you do harm reduction around that for people that are seeking out these medicines so that they're they're, they're getting the type of therapy that we see in your documentary. Anybody wants? No, hey, okay, I'll start then, I suppose. Um, we, so in the UK, no, let's start with retreats. In the Netherlands, um, some of my friends um, created Guild of Guides and uh, they collected all the guides in, in the Netherlands to come together and come with code of conduct. In that group, they were problematic actors already, but the hope was to call in and not call out and create something that they can see that everybody's agreeing to and it's probably a good uh, way to follow. So 
Um, that is a really good resource to read their recommendations. Uh, we always tell people to um, go to a retreat that's not maybe advertised on Facebook that much. You know, go to retreats that was recommended to you by someone. Uh, always meet the facilitators prior to it, uh, at least on Zoom if you cannot do it on purpose. So we try to give those flags, I mean, those, those to do for people. Check the reviews, check as much as you can. Um, and it, at any time, if it feels bad, wrong when you're there, um, you can go leave before you take psychedelic, obviously. If it feels off, just don't go for it, go back. And ideally go with a friend, you know, don't go alone to the retreat. So we uh, can educate people that way. But in terms of therapy, well, at the moment in UK, you only have ketamine clinics but, um, and studies. Um, but obviously, we, it will change at some point. So we have started Association for Psychedelic Therapies. Um, me and Ashley Murphy Boehner, who you've seen on screen, who talks about mindfulness. And then uh, Michelle and uh, Tim Reed and Maria Papasperu and many other um, UK-based therapists, psychedelic therapists, are coming together right now. And we're building code of, code of ethics and code of conduct. And we're working with Saipan, which is um, Leonie, who you've seen on screen, the participants of the studies came together to create Saipan to give the patients perspective. So we're trying to, and Haya will be our consultant. We have diversity consultants. We're working together to create this code of conduct and ethic, uh, ethics. And then we're trying to signpost on our website and social media campaigns for people how how to choose a study, is it good for you, you know, what to expect from the facilitator of the study, what is a transgression and what is acceptable. So it's a long work. We started only, well, a few months ago, but um, really the group meet, met for the first time about a week ago. But um, watch that space. I'm gonna post a link to it in a minute, but do sign up to our mailer if you're interested to hear about UK, we'll be posting. Uh, updates soon about it when we're done with work. And we're gonna, just for anybody watching and for anybody watching the recording with the show notes, we're gonna put all the links that these that uh, Anya and, and Haya and Mercedes provide us so that all that will also be in the show notes as well. And the Guild of Guides, I believe that's starting, there's a, there's a work in progress here in Canada to do something similar as the Guild of Guides and Dr. Jessica Rochester, of course, presented a large document a number of years ago that many people signed on to and edited, I think some of you did as well. So there is a question um, here. Do you think there has been sufficient public education or therapist training to actually allow psychedelic assisted therapy to be approved by the government and offered in a controlled way, perhaps clinics? Are we ready for this? And if not, what do we need to do? I'm happy to, to try to answer that. Um, so in terms of public education, we're still behind. Um, I have heard of some courses in universities that are teaching on psychedelics. There are courses that specifically um, teach about psychedelics, but this is more in, in higher education um, and not really public education. There are, there are um, I mean, there are websites and things of that sort that educate the public. So if you if you are interested, you can find uh, a lot of information online, either through websites or through or reading books. There's a plethora of books on the subject. However, formalized public education, there isn't any as of now. In terms of therapist training, there are excellent um, programs that are training uh, therapists and clinicians, and I'm going to I'm going to plug Influence, and I'll I'll post a little link to their um to to the website. So there and there's I think Maps has been training um many 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 therapists. I've done the first three parts of their first two parts of their training. So there is there enough um that's questionable? Is there something? There is something that's happening, and there is room for improvement and for more trainings to happen too, in my opinion. And a plug for BC has Vancouver Island University launches this fall postgraduate certificate in psychedelic assisted therapy. 
So, so there are the academic institutions or I, I imagine within my vision is, or my thought is that within five years where you will see most universities or colleges will have something, if not at least an introductory course. So, so I'm hoping, hoping that. So we're we're getting to an hour. We're posting a lot of these in the in the. Um... Sorry, is it okay to very shortly add to what Haya said? Because... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Paul, please continue. Just because actually in the UK there is already some public education happening, and surprisingly, conservative drug policy reform group. And I'm just going to add, our conservatives are much different than American conservatives. Just in case anybody wonders. Uh, they're quite far from, especially those guys, they are actually uh, working on a massive public campaign right now about rescheduling psilocybin. We're working with them. And also I would say Haya, myself, Psychedelic Society, we are constantly providing free or accessible education with, you know, we give free tickets to people who cannot afford to come. Um, and uh, for example, on the 23rd of April, we're hosting a drug policy symposium. We'll be educating people about how they can make a change, but we constantly release information, news, blogs, articles. We just constantly work on educating public. And it's maybe not enough, but we're doing whatever we can. I just want to plug the, the film again for a second because really our goal with the film is, is public education. We wanna be able to make the film accessible to everybody to be able to allow universities and schools and, and graduate um, programs to use it as a tool for education. So that's always been top of mind um, for why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so yeah, help us out. <laughs> yeah, we'll, put, we'll keep the go find me there we will post it out as well a couple more times and we will Thank definitely put the show notes this is really important there's the other again i mean i think what you guys this is it's such a beautifully put together and it's intelligent and it's really hitting on the your the maturity of you guys watching the changes here and, and putting out some very actionable thought thought processes of what is good therapy, what is a, um, a sober way of looking at this. So what's your response or your thoughts around how the media is on this generally? Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts too. That was the last, but, yeah, last question. Good God. Okay. Well, not quite, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I just, I, I just had a really long conversation with an investigative journalist mm -hmm. that said, you, you know, that said, you know, what we're, what we're sitting here in is instead of having sober, thoughtful conversations in the media people are trying to make their names and finding the angle anyways. And he said, that's not investigative journalism. That's tabloid. Yeah. Um, but what you've done here is different, but what are your thoughts on like, what should the, what is the responsibility of the media? And what do you think about how it's. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, it's such a massive um, question for media in general right now. And I think in terms of psychedelics, like, like I said, having, having, as a writer, as someone who's involved in media, as someone who's had relationships with people in the media to see how uh, the stigma was so strong that they didn't want to go near it. And then as, as soon as it became um, popularized, then writers began to use it as a way to, uh, to promote their own themselves. Like it's, it's a hot topic. And so um, there's questions of ethics and media and, and psychedelics as well. And I think it, it does come back to public education again and experience, like, are you qualified to be talking about what you're talking about? A, um, do you have the experience? Is this just another, cause I see most of the articles I, I read are so reductive and it's very clear to me that the person who's writing them has, has no, um, experience or understanding or like the understanding of the nuance and the nuances of psychedelics are, that's where the, where the juice is, where the meat is. And it's very difficult, I think, to get, a, get that across in any kind of way. Um, 
So I think there's a lot of grandstanding that happens, you know, with writers as well. And a lot of competition uh, to see who can like get this, the juicy story, uh, regardless of potentially the harm that can happen with that. It's, it's a bit messy, feels a bit messy right now, but definitely like an area that I would like to see a talked about more and like an integration of, um, psychedelic education into media literacy programs into into educational programs in the same way that you would educate journalism students about any other type of topic that's going on I think it needs to be taken a lot more seriously same with films I already told you a story about the filmmaker today but I get those all the time and it's either celebrity taking psychedelics and they have a great journey or just people becoming one and all lovely dovey. And in UK, at least around, I see very little drive to show the real thing and what it really is and have this balanced conversation. It's very pro psychedelics right now. And there's absolutely, our film is at the moment, I think the only one who actually like talks so much in detail about them not just being magic cure, them you know even titles like magic medicine those are the titles that are being used and it's all over the media and it's really scary because a lot of people will not go into reading nuanced things and they won't go to webinars they'll just read the headlines see a bbc documentary that people are happy after the mushrooms and they'll just go and do those mushrooms and often without the support they need without preparation just on a whim like that hoping for a magic cure. And it's really, really becoming a bigger problem day by day, I must say, in the UK at least. I'm sure it's the same in the US though. Did you want to jump in, Haya? Um, yeah, I think there's similar issues in, in, the, Middle, in the Middle East too, I think, because um, a lot of, um, well, in, in general, I think there, I would agree with what's being said about how they're, there, there was um, psychedelics were very demonized in the past, and now as a reaction, there's been a sense sensationalization, um, which can be, which is very dangerous. And I think that's definitely seeped into uh, the Middle East too. And I think in the Middle East, a lot of people hear about these stories about someone taking mushrooms once and um, their lives turning around, and people are, are, yeah, people are really desperate for, for. Um, for for something for for help basically so I think there tends to be a bit of a bias in, in the way that people select their news or the information that they receive so yeah so I think I mean not to not to say that uh, there isn't hope or that there there isn't um, a lot to be optimistic about but I just think we need to be a lot more critical in our thinking and in our reporting and in our filming um and in our and discussions so so yeah that's my that's my two cents thank you all um we're going to promote promote your gofundme um and uh, we hope that when the, the film is ready that you'll allow us to host a showing of it for our members we love that it, it looks wonderful so far and as we wrap this up i would i would love if each of you would take a moment or two to you know, as role models in the psychedelic renaissance, all of you, would you mind, um, what's your vision for the future or what's your hope for the future? And, and what's your, you to inspire people to do better and be better. What are, what are your thoughts going forward? I can go first then again. Um, I, my biggest hope is that more communities are being created because we have this community of 80,000 people in the UK that are psychedelic society followers, but we're encouraging them to create their own little communities and get support. And edu we, we also hope for enough education, public education for people to understand all the nuances and really for accessibility of those uh, treatments. Because right now with uh, ketamine costs, Ketamine therapy costing 7,000 pounds, hardly anyone can afford it. You know, it's excruciating money for us here. Um, 
and it looks like there's no bursaries or scholarships uh, and things like that yet. So I hope when psilocybin clinics open, we will have some not-for-profit organizations. Maybe the Association for Psychedelic Therapy will be powerful enough to offer cheap options for people, but not just give them psilocybin and then week of integration and go, but give them really proper help and support that they need to find to, with their career, with their loved ones, with therapy, with, with finding community, all those things. This is, this is big hope that we just don't forget about people who cannot afford it, because right now it's looking like we're forgetting about them. Kaya, do you want, I want, I want you to go, go first if you want to say something. Um, I, I think, I mean, my hope is for, or my, my advice, um, it would be for people to just really stay humble because it, it can be really easy to, um, yeah, it can, it can be really easy to be swept away by this movement so or or by the experiences that we have on psychedelics but it's remember it's important to for us to remember to stay humble and um and humble but also again i'm going to use the word optimism for a lot because i i did um I do have a background in positive psychology but yeah so be humble but also be optimistic um there will be i mean we we are learning more about um this field so there will be more effective ways to deliver these therapies and um, not just therapies also for for purposes of spiritual growth and um, and um, self discovery and such so so yeah so I mean be be humble be critical and um, and be optimistic. Um, I also really hope to see more community driven initiatives, because I think that's where inclusion and inclusivity uh, and, and, and accessibility will that's that's really the the way in which we'll we'll have more of that. And I really hope that um, I hope that I really hope that corporates are able to collaborate in an ethical way to make these substances more um, more accessible. I do have hope because I know a lot of people. There's we have we live in a world where there's a deficit in meaning. So I think that even in in the corporate realm, there there is a push for people to be um, more, I guess, more more um, considerate of others and uh, to yeah to be more ethical. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to Mrs. Yeah, I don't have a lot more to say because you, yeah, you you summed up a lot of what I was was thinking too. That I hope for a lot more, um, a lot more education so that people can be discerning. And I would like to see um, again community based approaches like what's happening um, with um, the ketamine program. Pam is a prime example, I think, of what could be possible when when a, a small group is given you know the freedom and a container to to create something in that way that's sort of outside of like you know trying to get the federal funding and all of that kind of stuff like what initiatives can happen um with a smaller group of people that trust each other in that sort of way of course i would love to see a larger um adoption of these therapies within the system um, and I think that that's, it's going to still take a lot of time and it, it's a lot of like forward motion and then some steps back and forward motion and, and, um, and I would like to see things, I would like to think, see things slow down a bit, to be honest. I, I think there is some value in, um, yeah, in a bit of a, a degrowth <laughs> movement within the psychedelic space. Um, but I, I do feel hopeful too. I wouldn't be here if I didn't, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Humbleness, connection, community. And what I love, I love that mycelial connection has become just a normal term now. <laughs> it's just so fantastic that, to hear that in, 
in your documentary. So thank you, Anya. Thank you, Haya. Thank you, Mercedes. We really appreciate you guys taking time. Haya, two, three in the morning now. Thank you so much. And um, the webinar will end abruptly in a short moment, but I just so, so many thanks to you guys for coming on, sharing your work with us. Thank you for being leaders in this, this realm and really leading the way and showing how it can be done right and, and some really good media. Because I'm like, really, this is the way it needs to be done. This high quality, uh, intricate and complex conversation done with all its complexities. So thank you so much. We'll be posting this for anybody watching who wants to share this with friends or family. The uh, posting goes up in about um, a week and we'll make sure all the connections, all the links, all the stuff from Anya, Haya and Mercedes that they want posted are posted alongside with those show notes. So thank you so much. And thank you, Pam. And thank you, James and everyone who attended. Thank you, James. James mm -hmm. is in our, web, our event, he's awesome. <laughs> All right. So and thank you for your work, Pam, because mm -hmm. we're big fans of you, actually. All that, all three of us. <laughs> it's a community, right? We're all we're all in this together. And together we will do it right. We will mess up sometimes too, but we'll of course correct and we'll figure it out as a community. So have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful sleep. <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>